Fine. Well, here's my friend, Brother Branham, to pour in the oil and wine and bring you the honey out of the rock. May the Lord bless you all together as we worship him by the word in the ministry. Thank you. Let's remain standing just a moment for prayer, if you will. Shall we bow our heads while we pray? Dear God, we are grateful to thee indeed for this grand privilege of assembling ourselves together and worshiping thee. And we would ask your blessings to continue, Lord, upon this service tonight. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will take its position at every seat in every aisle. And may men and women become conscious of his presence. And if there be sin in our midst, Lord, forgive us. And if there's sickness, heal us. And get glory out of the service, Lord. And now, when we read thy word, we pray that you will bless your word. And may we have fellowship around the word. For we ask it in the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I just come a little early tonight and was sitting back there on one of the benches. When I heard that good old-fashioned singing and the choir and the music, my, I thought maybe the millennium was about ready to start. And that sounded real good. If anything I like is good singing. And I wished, I always thought, I'd like for the Lord to give me voice to sing. I, I just can't hardly make a joyful noise. So, but... If you want an appointment with me, as soon as life is over and it's all finished, there's a, where the river of life comes out from under the throne, comes down this way and goes around the mountain of, of salvation, and where the trees are on either side of the mountain, over on that side, the, the choir sings, all the great voices sing over there. There'll be sinking, all of them uh, over there singing. And... Over on this other side is a little tree. I'll be sitting on that tree listening. So <laughs> that's where I want to be to hear that great angelic choir join in with the mortals. But you know, I was thinking that the angels, when Jesus comes, and one singing I want to be at, the great singing, is to hear the time that when we stand upon this earth, and sing the songs of redemption. Angels will stand just out off the earth with bowed heads, not knowing what we're singing about. They never had to be redeemed. We are the ones who will be rejoicing. We were the ones that were lost, and now we're found. And we'll sing the redemption stories when they won't even understand it. They'll just stand with bowed heads and listen to us sing. Won't that be a wonderful time? Oh, I long to see that. I love good singing, but it's one thing I don't like is an overtrained voice. Mm, overtrained. One that holds her breath just so long till they get blue in the face. You know, they're not singing to the Lord. They're just trying to see how long they can hold their breath. There's nothing any prayer that old-fashioned Pentecostal singing but the glory of God in the meeting. That's real joy to my heart. And I was so glad to refresh myself in the presence of that good singing tonight. The Lord bless you and keep that up. Last night I thought I'd kind of choke you out a little bit by being just a little long and we are a program drawn out. I met the chairman just now, a brother, and he said, no, Brother Brennan, that was all right. We don't close our church till 10 o'clock. He maybe oughtn't have said that to me. But I'll try to hurry right through tonight being a night, evangelistic night, and tomorrow, why, and tomorrow night we go right into the preaching and, and prayer for the sick again. Now tonight, I want to speak from a text out of the scripture. And I just love to read the word. Don't you love the word? How many Bible readers are here? Just raise your hands real high. Oh, that's fine. 
And to come down, when it, usually before we come for that anointing to, for the prayer line, I have to stay shut up fasting and praying. But when you don't have to do that in coming down to just speak, you just feel different. You know, it's the same spirit, but a different operation. And now I love to read the Word because the Word is God's Word. And God is just as good as His Word is. And now I wish to read from the book of Psalms, the 63rd Psalm. And I want to read the first three verses. O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsts for Thee, my flesh longeth for Thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see Thy power and Thy glory, so as I have seen it in Thy sanctuary. Because Thy loving kindness is better to me than life, my lips shall praise Thee. I like that second verse real well. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in thy sanctuary. But the subject would be tonight on the third verse. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Now I want to speak on the subject for about 20 or 30 minutes of life. Life is what controls us. We are known by the life that we live. And it's been said that your life speaks so loud that I can't hear your testimony. So therefore, to live a sermon would be much better than to preach one. The life you live sh shows what character you are, because your life always builds your character. And Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. So no matter what we would say or how much we would testify, if our lives doesn't coincide with that testimony, we are doing the kingdom of God an indebtedment by giving that testimony. Because people know what we are. And I've often thought at a funeral service, do you hear a man preach the funeral of some person that had lived ungodly and had never done anything right and yet preach as though they were a great person that had gone right on to heaven? Now, no matter what you'd ever say, the people already have their minds made up by the life that that character has left behind. And I like to think of Longfellow right here. When he said, Partings leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. That's the sound of life. Oh, I think it's beautiful. Now, the Christian church should have real character then. And if the life of Christ is in the church of Christ, then it's got to have the character of Christ. It'll produce the life of Christ. It's just no more than just what we call in the South common sense. If the life of the Spirit of Christ is in the church, it has to produce that life because the life that's in you makes your character. And what kind of characters ought we to be who have solemnly promised that we would serve the Lord Jesus as long as we live, and we have been baptized to his death, burial, and resurrection, and have put our names upon the church roll, take our place in Sunday school, and then go out and live something different. 
Oh, it's more in it's more indebted to the cause of Christ than all the bootleg joints we have in America. God grant the day that when man will live just what they are. And you can always tell them by their nature, their makeup. Now you cannot get a, a dove and a crow to agree together. Although they were both birds and set on the same roost in the ark. Both of them were fowls, they both had wings. But when the crow was let loose, he was satisfied with eating the dead carcasses that was floating around from place to place. And he never returned back again to the ark. But when the dove went out, she could find no rest for the soles of her feet, so she had to come back. See? The dove cannot eat with the crow. And the crow is a hypocrite. He can eat his own food and go over and eat with the dove also. But the dove cannot eat dove food and come over and eat crow food. So that's the way it is with hypocrites. They can get in the church and just rejoice like the rest of them and go right out into the world and eat again. But a genuine Christian can only eat the food of God. Why can't the dove eat crayon and stuff from the old earth and the old carcasses? Because it's the makeup of the dove. The dove is one bird who does not have any gall. If that dove would eat off of an old carcass, that dove would die immediately. Because it doesn't have any gall. It just can't digest that stuff. And a man or a woman that's ever been born of the Spirit of God just can't eat the things of the world and tolerate with sin because they have no more gall. They're made up different. And we're always known by the life that we live. Some time ago down in the South, when they had slavery, taking human beings and selling them just like you would an automobile, and there they would had lots like you'd have today used cars. Brokers came by and would buy slaves. Maybe this plantation had a hundred slaves, and some broker would come by and say, that big fella. I'll take him. And over here he had a, a big woman, maybe not his wife, breed them, make bigger slaves. And they would go around and buy them just like you would an animal. And one day a certain broker came by a plantation and he said, how many slaves do you have? And he told them a large number. And he for sale said, look them over and price them. And he looked and of course the slaves were brought over here from Africa by the Boers. And they were sold to the southern people for slaves. And they were sad. They would never go back home again. They'd have to die away from their own land. They'd never see their father and other mother no more. Sometimes their children or their wives, brothers or sisters, they'd never see them no more. So they were very sad. They were in a strange land with strange people. And the white people, would, slave owners, would whip them sometimes to make them work. Just like they would whip the horse. And they had to drive them around to do it. But this certain plantation where this broker was, he noticed one young fellow there that they didn't have to drive him. He had his chest out, his chin up. He was just right at the spot anytime. They didn't have to scold him or say anything to him. So this broker said to the slave owner, the plantation man, 
He said, I want to buy that slave. Oh, he said, he's not for sale. He said, do you, is he the boss over the rest of them? He's so much different. He said, no, he's just a slave. Well, he said, maybe you feed him better than you do the rest of them. He said, no, he eats out in the galley with the rest of the slaves. He said, well, what makes him so much different than the rest of them? He said, I wondered myself until I found out the truth. He said, that boy is the son of the king of the whole tribe. His father is the king of all of them. And though he's an alien away from home, he still knows that he's a king's son. And he conducts himself like that. Oh, what ought we to be as sons and daughters of God? How ought we to conduct ourselves? In this present world of sin and slavery, our characters and our conducts should be the highest to keep the morale of the rest of them moving. Because we are aliens. And we're strangers and pilgrims. But our Father is the King. Oh, he's rich with houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hand. Oh, I'm so glad to be a son of that king. Now, when I first read this scripture here, I thought, what must the prophet be speaking about? He said, thy love kindness is better to me than life. Now, I can't think of anything better than life. And there's only one type of eternal life. That comes from God. And God had no beginning, so he has no end. That great spirit... We would call it the the colors of the rainbow. The best way I could illustrate it. One was the spirit of love. The other the spirit of righteousness. And so forth, the seven spirits of God that made up God. And anything will take like the word love. There's two different words. We call love like we have for your wife. That's called in the Greek word, philio. And the love you have for God is agapo. Now, philio love, like you have for your wife, is a perverted love. Then from that kind of love, it perverts again to lust and on down. And all those kind of things must have an end to come back to that which had no beginning or end. Now, then, Agapo came all the way down from the highest to the lowest to redeem his creature and bring him back to himself. Oh, no wonder that people can't even expect it. One said, if we would ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parsnip made, and was ever stalk on earth a quill and ever man ascribed by a trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Or could the scroll contain the whole of those stretched from sky to sky? No one will never know what a gospel love meant to stoop down and to condescend to the lowest pits of the lowest hell to bring the fallen creature from a creature of time to a creature of eternity. We could not express it. 
But I was thinking as he said, Thy love, kindness is better than life. What could be better than life? Everything else has an end. But life has no end, so what could be more valuable than life? So I drew this kind of a conception of what David was speaking. And he must have been talking about a different kind of life. Now life has many interpretations. And we notice that sometimes life has an interpretation like this. Oh, we're really living it up. That's not life. Somebody said, making a lot of reverie and saying, this is life. Some months ago, I was in a great city and I was having a meeting. And that night, it was in another nation, Canada. And that night, a certain organization of America, they was having their convention up there. And I noticed as I left this great mammoth hotel, there were many people coming. The Americans were swarming in, and they were drinking. And women and men all alike. After my services was over that night, I got on the elevator out and started up. And the whiskey bottles were everywhere. And I said to the elevator boy, I said, it looks like it's somebody's sure been drinking. He said, they sure have. And he stopped up at about this eighth or tenth floor to let me out. And when I got out, I was in the elevator by myself with the boy. When I stepped out, I heard something up the hall. And as I come out of the little, a little place where we come out from the elevator, I looked up the hall, and I never heard such a noise of all the dirty words I ever heard. And I stopped just a moment. Oh, this is shocking. Two young ladies about, oh, in their late 20s or early 30s, with just their underneath clothes on. Both women married with wedding rings. And they had a big bottle of whiskey. And they were passing it one to another and pulling up their little underneath clothes and screaming and you know what maybe a husband at home taking care of the baby while they were having a little innocent fun it's sin and vice versa some woman home taking care of the baby while her husband is up there with her having a little innocent fun it's rank ungodly filthy sin and the wages of it is death separation from God forever and here they come down the hall and one man grabbing and pulling this way and another and that way the man out of the doors I just step back and watch just a moment with my Bible and finally when that got loose the last man and he sprawled out the floor and had to climb in on his hands and knees to get back in the room. And somebody pouring whiskey on the top of him, bringing him in. Oh, such an ungodly sight. And I looked at that and I thought, oh God, I see these two beautiful little women just with their underneath garment and they stopped just a little above me and they tried to pass the bottle one to the other and one reached down and picked up her little skirt and kicked her feet up in the air and she said whoopee this is life I couldn't stand it any longer I stepped out I said sister you are mistaken this is death So death, life has more and more interpretation.
interpretation. The Bible said she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she is alive. That's what God said. And she looked over and she talked about it. I said, just a moment. This same Bible in my hand. She blared her eyes and looked at me. I said, I'm a gospel preacher. And I'm an American too. But I'm almost ashamed of my country that you come here and represent it in the way that you're doing. And I said, shame on you. They dropped the bottle and down the hall they went as hard as they could go. They thought they were living, but they were dead in sin and trespasses. Oh, what a condition. In Hamilton, Ohio, recently, I was having a meeting and they got up to seven, eight, ten thousand people and I had to stay outside the city. We were eating at a little Dunkard restaurant. The ladies were clean and nice looking as they come in and waited and everything just so decent looking. Well, we enjoyed that Sunday came and Sunday afternoon I was going to speak. Dr. Baxter was let, let me speak with the campaign manager. I'd speak on Sunday afternoon, then wait till Sunday night for the healing service. I got hungry. I thought, I believe I'll go get something to eat. Just a sandwich kind of hold me over. And as I went out the door, the little Dunkard restaurant, they had closed up and they were gone to church. And I seen just across the other side a typical little roadside place with sandwiches and things. I stepped in there. And when I stepped in, there was a policeman with his arms around the woman playing a slot machine. And gambling is illegal in Ohio. And a man of my age, which was perhaps a married man with a bunch of grown children, I looked out the other end and there was a young teenage girl sitting by a bunch of them motorcycle jacket boys with the, you know, with their clothes half hung off and God bless that man in that college the other week made that bunch of hoodlums straight up. He said, you'll either wear different clothes or get out of this school. If more men had more American spirit and backbone like that, we'd have better schools and less juvenile delinquency. Stabbings on the street and things. And here they were sitting back there and a little teenage girl in her skirts hanging down and them boys with their arms around her hips and things. I thought, oh mercy, let me get out of here. And as I turned to look, there was an old grandma. Would have been 65 easy, if not more. Her skin was all wrinkled up. And she had on that manicure on her lips, or whatever what you call the stuff, blue looking. And the little lady with her hair cut and all frizzled up. And a pair of these little old ungodly clothes on, set with two old men in the summertime and one of them with a great long government overcoat on. And they excused themselves and went out and I thought, God, how can you stand to look upon sin if it would make me a sinner saved by grace feel like it? What would it do to a holy God look like to just destroy the thing? And as I looked at it, I stepped behind the door and started out and a vision came before me. I seen the world and around the world was a spray and it looked red. And then all of a sudden, I seen uh, through the vision the Lord Jesus and sins were catching against him and it was my sins. And it would beat her from one side to the other, like a bumper on a car. And every time I'd do something, it would strike him. And he looked at me with weary looking eyes. I said, my God, have I caused that? 
I looked clean, there was my book open, my name at the top, all kinds of dark streaks in it, and I said, Lord Jesus, forgive me. And he touched his finger to his side and wrote on it, pardoned, and threw it behind him. And I said, oh Lord God, I really don't know what to say. I just love you for that. He said, now I forgive you your sins, but you want to blow her up. And I've seen the woman. I come from the vision. I walked over to her and I said, how do you do? And she said, how do you do? She was drinking, almost drunk. And I said, uh, may I sit down? She said, thank you, but I have company. I said, I didn't mean it that way. I said, may I just speak to you a minute? She said, you may. I said, I was standing there at that door wanting to know why God didn't strike you dead. And want to know if my little Sarah and Rebecca, when they get to be women, if they'll be raised up under such stuff as that. And I told her about the vision. She said, I perceive that you're a minister. I said, I am. I said, my name is Branham. She said, oh, you're the Mr. Branham down at the army. I said, yes, ma'am. I said, I'm sorry that I said that or thought that in my heart. And she started weeping. And then she caught me by the hand and she said, preacher, I'm going to tell you something. I was raised up in a Christian home and my father was a Baptist preacher. And she told me about her marriage to a, a boy that drank and she had two daughters then that was married and had children. They were all Christians, but she took the road that's wrong and she said, I guess I'm finished. I said, no, as long as you've got life, you've got hope. Because the blood of the Lord Jesus has this world encircled. And God can't see your sins. But someday when your life passes beyond that circle of blood, then you've already judged yourself. And there on the floor, in that little old place, I had the privilege of leading that precious soul to the Lord Jesus Sent her back home rejoicing. Oh, the depths of the love of eternal life that God desires to give to His people. It was a changed life. She thought she was living over there, but she was dying. Now she's living and will live forever because she has eternal life. From death unto life. Now... Some people think that drinking and smoking and gambling and all trying to do the things that they do in reverie, they think that that's life, but it's death. And what makes them do that anyhow? Here's the reason they do it. Because God made a human being to thirst. You were made for that purpose. Every organ in your body was made for a purpose. Everything is for a purpose. And God made a man to thirst because He wanted him to thirst after Him. But the devil has perverted it. And he's trying to make you think something different and trying to quench that blessed holy thirst by filling it with sin. He's giving you death instead of life. It's a perverted life. It cannot be the right life. And the devil is doing that because that God made you to thirst but thirst after Him. That little thing in you that makes it want to rejoice. Get on the dance floor and carry on. That's perverted. That thing that makes you want to drink and act the way that people do. 
that the devil is trying to take sin and quench that God-given thirst. When God made you to thirst for Him, and you can never be satisfied until God comes in and satisfies that thirst. Oh, how dare you to try to quench that blessed holy thirst with the things of the world when God give it to you to thirst after Him. Now, I hope I don't hurt anyone's stealing unless it's deserved. But I just want to call some things to remembrance to you. What's happened to the church lately? The church used to be a separated people. I didn't know what group I was speaking to until the man told me here I was speaking to Pentecostal people. Now let's go back just a little bit. You know... A few years ago, it was wrong for Pentecostal women to cut their hair. What happened? If it was wrong then, it's wrong now. Now you say, well, my pastor. Well, you need a new pastor. The scripture says if a woman cuts her hair, she dishonors her husband. And if she's dishonorable, she should be divorced. You won't like me after this. But I'm going to be honest that at the day of judgment, I don't want to stand with that wishy-washy bunch who was ashamed to tell you. Preaching's not a meal ticket. It's a responsibility to God to tell the truth. And it used to be wrong for Pentecostal women to wear that uh, make makeup manicure stuff on their face. It used to be, don't tell me, I remember. And you free Methodists, and you missionary Baptists and Pilgrim Holiness and Nazarenes. It used to be wrong. What happened? His old brother Methodist preacher friend of mine by the name of Kelly. And he used to sing a little song. We let down the bars. We let down the bars. We compromise with sin. We let down the bars and the sheep got out. But how did the goats get in? It's because we let down the bars. You're supposed to be a different people, a peculiar people, a called out people, a separated people, a people walking after the things of the Spirit and not the things of the flesh. Oh, we used to be down on the corner with the guitar and some salvation. And today we're in a great, big, swell, half a million, two million dollar cathedrals with a big bunch of creeds like the old coal formals we used to talk about. Pot can't call kettle black. That's right. And you Pentecostal women wouldn't let your girls put on them little old vulgar looking clothes and get out on the street. Then talk about juvenile delinquency. Not only do they do it, but many you do too. Oh, you say, I don't wear them shorts, I believe they call it, and halter necks. I, I, I don't wear them, I wear slacks. The Bible said that a woman that will put on a garment that pertains to a man is an abomination in the sight of God. That's what the Bible says. And 
is the day you take women come down the street with these little old skirts on. It's so tight and so sexy dressed and call themselves Christians. Don't act much like a, the king of heaven's daughter not conducting yourself. And look, let me tell you something, sister. And I'm only saying this for your good. When the judgment comes, you're going to answer for committing adultery. You might be as pure as a lily to your husband or to your boyfriend. But when you put on clothes like that and walk out on the streets, if a sinner looks at you and lusts after you, the Bible said that he has committed adultery with you in his heart. And at the judgment bar, you're going to answer for committing that adultery because you presented yourself to him like that. Jesus said that. Who's guilty, the sinner or you? You are. He's a hog and a pig by nature. He's never been converted. But if he answers for committing adultery, who did he commit it with? Whosoever, sinner or saint, looks upon a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her in his heart already. Think of it. Oh, you say, Brother Branham, that's the only kind of clothes they make. They still got sewing machines. There's no excuse for that. You know that's right. Does that act like a daughter of the king? Well, you say the rest of them do, but you're different. You're an alien. You ought to conduct yourself like the daughter of the king. And these women here might say, Brother Branham, we heard you was a woman hater, so now we know you are. That's not so. I'm a lover of the Lord Jesus and responsible for his word. Say, why do you pick on us women? All right, you men, here you are. Any man that'll let his wife smoke cigarettes and wear shorts shows what he's made out of. He's no man. He ain't got an ounce in him. A son of God, the head of the house. That's right. Uh, you know that's the truth. It shows what you're made of. Man's not measured by muscles. That's beast, brute. Man's measured by character. And if you're a son of God, you're measured by your character. And you're supposed to be the ruler of the house. And God will hold you responsible for what she does. But she's a God in America. And you remember, I've already predicted in 1933, a woman would rule this nation before the chaos, but the annihilation. See, you're on the money. She's everything. She's a goddess. She's, Hollywood's done it. The reason that takes place is because you stayed home on Wednesday night from the prayer meeting to watch some old dirty play of We Love Susie or something like that showed what was in you to begin with. And you women, instead of having your prayer meetings on the morning, the 10 o'clock prayer meeting, you stay home to watch some vulgarity stuff and dirty jokes like that Arthur Godfrey or Elvis Presley, some scavenger feeding on the carcass of their own people. Only one difference between Elvis Presley and Judas is carrot. Judas got 30 pieces of silver and Elvis got a million dollars and a fleet of Cadillacs. He's a traitor to Christ. And yet he becomes a god almost to the teenager. Working up in such a condition that a little young lady get in there and jerk their underneath clothes off and throw it on a platform for him to autograph. Talk about devil power. Go over to Africa and see if that old boogly woogly or Ever what they call it, rock and roll? That's originated with the Hottentots in Africa. And you're trying to satisfy that longing and blessed holy thirst by poking that trash 
down in the place where God wants to live and to give you freedom and holiness and happiness. What a disgrace. What a letdown to the American people and to you Pentecostal people in Pilgrim Holiness and Nazarene who profess a higher calling in that. Shame on you. You're dying and rotten in your own corruption. No wonder we can't have a revival in America. No wonder God can't place His gifts in the church. What has He got to place them in? You think He would place gifts in a thing like that? He just couldn't do it. I hope that you understand what I mean. It's time for a house cleaning in the house of God all the way from the pulpit to the janitor. An old-fashioned, God sent St. Paul's revival and the Bible, Holy Ghost, back into the church. Back to make men and women sons and daughters of God. Can't you realize that old dirty spirit of the devil gets into you and makes you act like that? Some time ago, I was across the America and I had to take a bunch of books over in a truck. I hired a sinner to drive it because I couldn't find no one else. When I landed on to the ground of great denominational Pentecostal people, and the sinner got out of the truck, was unloading trucks and, uh, with the books and so forth, and he was smoking a cigarette. And one of the great high officials come up to me and he said, Brother Branham, I'm surprised at you. So what's the matter? He said, that man's a smoking a cigarette that unloaded your truck. We holiness people do not believe in smoking cigarettes. I said, neither do I. He said, but our people, it'll be a stumbling block in their way. I said, I couldn't have no, get no one to drive that car. I had two trucks. I had to drive one myself and get him to drive the other. I'm going to lay him off in a few minutes. He knows that. He said, well, don't you never do that again. He said, because our people are holiness people. I said, I'm sorry I did it, sir. If I had anyone else, I wouldn't have done it. We turned around and walked to the place where there's several thousand people assembled together. And he, he said, here is my wife. I want you to meet her, Brother Brandon. And I looked. She said, she'll be your pianist this afternoon. And not for jokes. This is no place for a joke. That's the trouble of the day. We got too much Hollywood evangelism and not enough the old-fashioned conviction of the gospel. And that woman stood there with a dress on so tight looked like the skin is on the outside. And she had great big earrings on and stuff all over her mouth and her blue places behind her eyes. A real short cut hair and it all fuzzed up like a fuzzy worm. And she said, looked at she said, How do you do, Dr. Brandon? I said, Howdy. I said, I want to ask you something, sir. He said, Yes, Brother Branham. I said, Is your wife a saint? He said, Certainly. I said, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but she looks like a hank to me from the way she's standing there like that. Listen, lady, let me tell you something as your brother. There was one woman in the Bible that painted her face. So you can see what God thinks of painted face women? Dog meat. That's God's dog meat. What did he do it for? Not to meet God. That's not a joke. Get that out of your mind. What does the woman do it for? What? To appear before man. That's the same thing Jesse Bell does. You have to hear the voice go, <whistles> that hound dog call, the wolf call. That's right. It's because the pastor has let down. And you wouldn't have an old-fashioned God sent minister. You've got some little Hollywood type of a guy that likes to 
see all the Germans jump up and down and holler, Hallelujah! The devil can do the same. Holiness becometh the Lord. And if you love the world, all the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. That's what the scripture says. Now you see what you're doing? The wrong spirit's got among you. And it's making you try to satisfy that blessed Holy Thirst that God gave you to worship Him with. You're trying to satisfy it with television, radio, all the fancy things of the world, and makeups and carry on. I think you should look clean. Don't think I think it's that you ought to have dirty clothes on. I think you should look the best for be decent. Clean! I am a We ain't out in the backyard with a little old lawn there when the man's coming home with little old clothes on short and you stand before your husband with. And man come in and permit him such as that. And then deacons in the church. Shame on no wonder we're gone. Listen, don't you worry about Russia whipping us. It ain't the rod and it pecks on the apple hurts it with the worm at the core. Why all wrongness? Was what's killing us. We are out of this peace of the Lord God. If we only act like children of God, He'll protect His own. You know that's the truth. Now, that blessed thirst, what made it come? God made you that way. And the devil turns out that, oh, this is life. This is life. But you're receiving death all the time. You don't know what pleasure is till you really get those carnal roots out of your heart and get God in there, where you can fellowship and worship God and rejoice and sing in the Spirit and walk and speak like a real lady or a gentleman, house under control, your children all obedient. A few days ago, down in Ohio, in a court, they said that all children had to be sent to college. They want more literacy in Ohio. And the Amish people don't send their children to these modern high schools. And they never had, on the record of all the Amish and different history, of one case of juvenile delinquency. Let them dress different, like different, and be peculiar and that, but they haven't had no, no juvenile delinquency. Not one case on the records of, the, of America. They don't send them around kind of places. And they pass the law that they have to go to their own high schools and colleges. And their own mother and father was called in because they didn't send their son. And the judge said, you'll either send him or you'll serve two years in prison. I was in Little Town, Ohio at the time it happened. And the father said, I refuse to do it, sir. Not to be indifferent, but because that I come to America thinking that this was freedom of religion. We don't have no more democracy. Freedom of religion. He said you'll either abide by our laws or you'll pay, pay the penalty like the rest of them would. He said, I'll refuse to send him. He said, I'll send you and another two years in the penitentiary. The last tower of democracy fades in that curtain. The father got up and said, very well, I'll spend it to save my son. I don't want any of your rock and rolls and your nonsense. And when he started out, the unjust judge tried to justify himself the thing of, remember the scripture says, give Caesar what Caesar and he turned around and said, Thank you, God. But it didn't begin just in a few minutes. His whole bitch quit the job and resigned their office. God be blessed for us, free, real outstanding Americans up there. What should the church do? Take a stand and stand there without moving. What's that first thing you for? To worship God. Oh, David, who wrote the psalm, the prophecy. He was an outdoor man who loved the outdoors. Oh, how wonderful it is to love outdoors. 
far out into the mountain streams and never go hunting, not to kill the game, just to be alone with God, see him moving in his bushes and hearing him call the elk and the wolf and, uh, and the bear and the squeak and to hear all, all in nature, the birds, everything, God's just everywhere. One day, standing in the Rocky Mountains, I was way high. I was hunting that far of the rancher, and I, there was nobody within all oh, just 50 miles, 40 miles anyhow of it. The closest place was way back in behind the Corral Peaks, on the, over the Burkett Pass, many, many miles. And I ranched in there many, many times, running with cattle and so forth, and riding around up. So we know about all the country, I go there to hunt. So it's early and the elk hadn't come down yet while we were hunting because we were up high. The snows hadn't come. <clears throat> and as he said, now, Billy, I'm going to take the, the northern slope of the mountain, and you take the southern eastern slope, and we'll meet about three days, and if you happen to get a big bull hanging up, we'll pack him on the pack horse that's coming back. I said, okay, Jeff. We started off this meeting a certain day. I've been the second day, I was way high because of seen your elk track, and they were up high yet. And in the fall late, the storms come over, and rain, and the snow, and then the sun will come and dry it out, and it's stormy. And there come a great sudden gush of wind was coming down with the storm and rain, and I got behind a tree, and I was standing behind the tree just a minute. And the storm went past, and oh, and it did blow, and there's a bit of an old blow down there. And after the storm passed, it, it was cool while it was raining, and icicles was hanging all over the, the evergreen. You know how it gets them? And just then the great sun began to set in the crevices in the west, and the great, like an eye of God, began to peep through, and a rainbow formed over the valley. I said, oh, God, it's good to be here. Just then I heard the old bull elk bugle and another one answered him. The herd being broke up in the time of the storm. My mother's a half Indian. They come off the reservation. And then that begins to call the deep. They had said call into the deep. The old bull howled and they answered it down in the valley. Oh my, something set my spirit to scream. I got so happy I said, God, it's so good to be there. I set the rifle down and around and around and she went screaming as hard as I could. Shaking my hands if someone would have come in the woods and thought there was a maniac out there. I didn't care. I was worshiping the Lord. Just having a glorious time. After all, I noticed a little old pine squirrel, a little guy about that long, the fussiest thing in the woods. Jumps up on a stump and begins, can I tell you, can like he's going to cut me to pieces. I said, don't get so excited, little fella. I wouldn't hurt you, did I make you scared? I'm worshiping the God that created you. What's this? And round and round and round the tree I went again. I said, you ought to do that. And I noticed the little fellow in his eyes bulged out almost on his cheek. Oh, come on, can you keep talking to the head looking down like that? And the storm had forced the big eagle down, man. That's what he was scared of. The big eagle jumped up on the limb. And I thought, now, God, why did you stop me from shouting? Now, why did you put that needle out there before me? Why? I'm really worshiping you. I know you're ever worth but would you be in that eagle? And I happened to notice that eagle. He wasn't scared of me. And I said, are you afraid of me? And that great big velvet eyes looked at me. He wasn't afraid of me. And I said, oh, I see God in that eagle. I said, because he's not a scared. God's not a scared. You're afraid. If I set my healing, I can't hold out. If I get a crash my heart, I'm afraid somebody will laugh at me. Uh, you're not in condition yet. You ain't dead enough yet. So this eagle wasn't scared. I thought, why is it you're not scared? I noticed him feeling his wings when I was suffering with his feathers. I thought, oh, that's it. I see God gave you two wings. And if God gave that eagle two wings, and you know he could be in that tent before I get the rifle from my hand, if you could trust these wings like that, what ought a church do to steal with the Holy Ghost? As long as you can feel him around you, know that he's there. What's you afraid of? You're afraid your boss will say, How'd you get lost? Oh, I can't. Don't be scared, say the Lord, God heal me. Don't be afraid. And I noticed he got, I said, you know I can shoot you? And I grabbed him a rifle. What? With 
that way again. I know she wasn't afraid of me, but he's getting tired of that little old chipmunk. Sitting there, chatter, 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 just all stuck. <laughs> so he got sick and tired of me, he made a big jump. He made about two stops, and he was coming out of the timber. And then I wept. He just took his great wings and spread them out like this. He never flopped his wings anymore. He just learned how to shed his wings. And every time the wind would come up, he'd ride up on it. Ride up on it. Until he become just a little spot. I stood and looked at the tears running down my cheeks. I said, oh God, that's it. That's what you want me to stop here and set that storm for. That's the idea. Just know how to set your wings in the power of God, your wings of faith, and when the Holy Ghost rolls in, right up on it. Just keep on going. Get away from this little old woodchuck, shatter, shatter, stand the days of miracles is past, and there's no such a thing as divine healing. Right on it. God wants to feel that heart. David said, as the heart thirst after the water bit, my soul will thirst after thee, O God. Listen close, I'm closing. David in the mountains, and he had been a woodsman, a hunter. He knew about the digger. I've seen them many times. Down in Louisiana, they, they hunt them with dogs. Over in Africa, there's a wild dog. And it's very strange. And any deer hunter here knows if you bring the deer, hurt him, and if he can get the water, he's lost him. As long as he can find water, he can live. But as the dogs just hurt the little fellow, you see that they'll see that deer standing. And the dog has a trick or the wolf either. And he slips up in the easy. Now his technique, he's got two blood stains down here on the side of his mouth. And he grabs the deer. Just behind the ear where the juggler vein crosses, he sinks those teeth in, the coyote, the wolf, the wild dog. And when he does, he throws himself. When he does that, I see him cut steers through. Coyote. And he, he's sneaking. You don't know where he's at. And he grabs the deer and he swings his weight and cuts the juggler vein in the middle deer makes a few drops and he's gone. Then he's covered over with dogs and coyotes eating on him, pulling the hide and meat right off his bones. How true that is tonight. With a many little innocent Christian, you little girls, that this old Elvis Presley rock and roll and Pat Boone and Arthur Godfrey stuff, the devil to hang you, put that stuff on your face to get the boys to give that, that's wolves, that's what they are, that's true. To give that whistle, you dress yourselves in little clothes like that and Say, show that little body of yours, oh, honey, dear. I got two little girls at home, too. God be merciful, child. You don't realize, honey, that that's the trap of the devil. Don't never dress yourself so a man will look at you like that. Keep yourself for your little sweetheart husband that's coming someday. God will give it to you. And there are the wolves of hell that after you. And you were coaxing them on. One day the jugger vein will be cut. You'll be gone. Then you'll stumble a couple of times. You're gone. Innocent. Oh, just a little rock and roll won't hurt anything. And I know it's all YMCA's are teaching it. What's that scene in their call for? Is that Christ or cursing? But this grace. She's gone. The whole nation's polluted. It's rotten to the core because the church let out. It ought to be a standard. The deer, the dog has another technique to grab the deer. If it misses its ear, it'll grab it in the side. The hind quarters of the deer is heavier than the front quarters, and if he can grab him right in the flanks of those teeth and take a big bite in the deer, if he's not a smart deer, he'll. The dog will, in the mid-center of him, or the wolf will throw the deer on the ground. If he misses this part, he'll catch him in the side. But if the deer is real smart and jumps quick, it can't slowly jump, it's got to jump fast. And if the little deer quickly swings sideways, 
the, the dog will pull the whole mouthful out. And then if it is quick and fast, it'll get away. Listen, sister dear, if you're right on that verge and the devil has grabbed you, jump quick! Don't wait till the next revival. Jump now! If you've had your first rock and roll date, don't let her go again. Jump away from me quick as you can. If you've been dressing that you ought to, dress decent, act like a lady, a Christian. The hounds of hell is galloping after you. Then when she's grabbed, the little fellow run as hard as he can. The bird's pouring out. Watch him. He's got to find water. They're right behind him. He must find water. Be better find water and gone. Let him find water and he'll live. But he must get the water right quick. And if he can pass over a stream here, hunters know what I mean. He'll get a drink. Run over the hill. Freshen him up. He'll come down and get a drink again. Lead the dogs one way or the other. The hunter he on. Back and forth and cross that river and he can live. But think of David. When he said, as the heart painted for the water brook, so am I so the thirst after the old God. If that deer don't get the water, he's dead. And if you can't get to Christ, not the church, the devil tries to put a false thing in you there. Tries to make you satisfy that great thirst in you by saying, God's your church. That's just as almost as bad as doing something else. He tries to say, oh, I'm a Presbyterian. I'm Pentecostal. I'm Catholic. I'm a Baptist. That don't mean one thing to God. You can be any church member and go to hell like a Martin Luther's box. Jesus said, except the man be born again, he will have no eyes in him. When I pay my tithes, I do this, that's all right, brother dear. When I tell you our church has got the biggest missionary uh, offerings in the country, that's very fine. We got the loveliest church in the city, more members, that's fine, but that don't have one thing to do with salvation. Not one thing at all. God don't even recognize it. Except the man be born again of the Spirit and of the water he will in no eyes in it. Intellectual one half has got to come down here to a birth. John church as much as you want to. Good holy churches that still won't have a thing to do with it. Be baptized, face forward, backward, poured, sprinkled, won't you just go down or a dry center and come up a wet one. It don't do one thing to you but pollute it. You're a two-fold charm over hell you was when you started. Most miserable person in the world is someone trying to impersonate Christianity. Miserable to live for Christ is a joy. Wings that you fly over there, and your soul begins to thirst like the deer. Oh, if I can't find it, I'll die. You'll find it. If you thirst after God like that, you'll find it. Oh, my soul longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. I long to see thy power like I see it in thy sanctuary. Is your soul thirsting like that tonight? Lord Jesus, come to us. Bless us. Do for us like you did for them in the early days. Take the world from me and let me worship you. Is your soul thirsting like that? Quickly, there will be a spring break up for the side of you. You'll live. But as long as you say, I'm just as good as the rest of them. I don't have to do these things. You're dying, you don't know it. As the heart pains for the water brook, my soul first after the old God. He must find water or he die. He must find God or you die. I must see you, Lord, or I'll perish. Oh, how we need him tonight. In an old-fashioned, God-sent revival, where men and women really get right with God. Let us pray. Dear God, this little broke up salvation message here tonight. But I hope that it will not return bad which thou hast promised you said it would accomplish that which it was purposed for. 
And thou knowest everything, Father, so thou knowest it was purpose to try to save the church and the people, not to be different or anything, but to be, to bring the church back into fellowship with thee. We would pray you would grant it tonight, Lord. Let these thirsty souls begin to look and wonder now. Let them search the old God till we get back again. Let the preacher forsake his little petty doctrines and come back and bring the church to Christ again. No matter if he's Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, whatever he may be. Let the members go to thirsting for you, Lord. I've just got to have you. Then there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Where sinners plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. There in the eyes of bias he washed all my sins away. May that be the thirst of these young women and old women, young men and old men. Grant it, Lord, create in them a thirst tonight. Thirsting after thee, let them know that even this worldly stuff, that they're, they're trying to satisfy themselves. Oh, I belong to church. It's no harm to do this or that. Oh, God, wake them up to know that Satan's doing that. And that thirst that they have for good time and so forth was putting them to worship you and to have your blessings and to enjoy your fellowship. Not the fellowship of the world but the fellowship of Christ. Grant it, Lord. We ask it in his name. Amen. While you remain just a moment, now tomorrow they're going to give the prayer cards for him and tomorrow night. Tonight was a... I want to make an altar call just a minute. So, how many is here for their first time that heard about the meeting and how the Lord gives vision? But you've never been in one. Let's see your hands. Is there ain't many here? Oh, the whole front part of it is full of it. All right, the newcomers. You've heard that how our Lord Jesus said he did nothing until the Father showed him by vision what to do. You remember that? You read that in the Bible? Does Jesus, if he would appear today, would he do the same that he did back there? Would it make your soul thirst after him if you could see him stand here? in this building among us all, and perform and do the same things that he did when he was here on earth, would you be thankful for that? Raise up your hand and say, oh, it will create another thirst. Blessings be on you. Now, I don't, I just want to pray and ask the Lord, from right here, not to bring you up here, I feel real led as I look down here and see that picture here with that, the pillar of fire on it that led the children of Israel the wilderness and no, I look out here and I see him hanging right over the audience. So I, whether we got prayer cards or not, I believe God wants to do something here that you thirsty souls will go to thirsting for. Now you out there that's sick and afflicted, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the high priest right now that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. All that know the scriptures say that, say Amen. When he was, the Bible said in Hebrews 13, 8, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that right? Yeah. Then, when he was sure on earth, a woman was sick one time with a blood issue. So the man was all crowding around him, patting him to the shoulder, and was uh, blessing him, and so forth. And how do you do, Reverend? And we're glad to meet you. Thank for you here in this campaign, and you know, like that. And going on as men and people do. But there was a little woman. She had a blood issue, and the doctors could do her no good, so she slipped to the crowd and she said, Oh, he is the Son of God. If I can touch his garment, I'll get well. And she touched his garment, went back out, Jesus stopped and said, Who touched me? That was Jesus yesterday, wasn't it? For the feeling of an infirmity. And Peter said, Well, Lord, he rebuked the Lord. And he said, Well, all of you are touching me. Why do you say who touched me? He said, But I've gotten weak. Virtue's gone out of him. Strength. And he looked around over the audience, perhaps maybe the size of this tonight, maybe larger, maybe smaller. Looked around, and he found that person to touch him. And he told her what her infirmity was, that her faith had made her well. How many know that's true? Well, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he said, a little while, and the world won't see me no more. 
Yet you'll see me, for I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. The branches bear fruit of the vine. Now, he's in his church working. I wonder if, if there's that kind of faith tonight in this audience that could touch his garment while I would submit myself to him with you, that he'd come back down in the form of the Holy Ghost and do the same thing here on this platform tonight. You out there without your prayer card, this new crowd in here, if he would, you see him with a card, well, now, if he come down and tonight and do that from the platform here and do the same thing that he did when he was here but in the flesh, would you believe that he was in his church thing working? Would you believe that? The same with him? Let us pray again. Now, sinner, be real reverent. Lord God, I'm trusting that you'll do this. I don't know. I'm praying that you will because of the little vision just a moment ago. Grant, Lord, that it will be so in Christ's name. I submit myself to you and ask that the Holy Spirit will get into the hearts of the people. May angels take their positions beside these sick people and beside the unbeliever and the sinner and let them know that you're here and that thirst that they have longed to see. Grant, Lord, that you'll be standing right down. Some of them are here thirsting for healing. You're the waters of life. And I pray, God, that you'll act in the same way through your mystical body here at the church that you did when you were here in your corporal body in the form and name called Jesus. Grant it, Father. Through Jesus' name, amen. I'm asking for reverence. And now just be real reverence. Every person in here, as far as I know, is a stranger to me except my son, Mr. Vail and Mr. Gold. I hear others I do not know. Looks like I ought to know this man sitting right here. Uh, I know you, sir. Uh, your face looks familiar to me, but I, I don't remember your name. But that's the only one that I know. Now let us be real effort and just look to the Lord Jesus and say, Now, Lord, you out there, you that's sick. You say, Lord Jesus, the man has told me that if we thirsted, why you were the one to, to give us, suffice us this thirst that we had. He told us that you was raised from the dead and you're the same all the time. Now, I did read in the Bible where a woman touched your garment and you knew her trouble. It's like you could tell them Philip where he was and Peter what his father's name was and all them things in the Bible. And the Pharisees called you a devil. Said you was a mind reader of a Beelzebub, which is a devil. But then people who that miracle was performed on know you was the son of God. You told a woman at the well where her sins was. And she ran to the city and said, Come see the man that told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Christ? Now, Lord, if you remain the same, it's a dark day. Some people say, The Methodist is right. The Baptist is right. The Luther is right. The Pentecost is right. God, what is right? Jesus is right. And I believe he's in every one of your churches. Certainly he is Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal. But he loves you. Don't make him know what church you belong to. Just look at him and say, Lord, I believe. May he grant. Now, while we're in prayer, everybody just reverence. But if you're praying and you hear me call, look up, see, because I have to speak quick. Here's the pictures. They told you about it. George J. Lacey, here the FBI, fingerprint and document, took the picture of an angel of God. The pillar of fire that led the children of Israel. Now, all know that that pillar of fire was Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Well, he said, I come from God and I go to God. And as he went back, Paul met him on the road to Damascus. A light, pillar of fire again, put his eyes out. Peter in the prison, pillar of fire, come in and let him out. Here he is today, appearing at the end of the Gentile age, the same Jesus. The scientific age that we live in, he's appeared to the scientific world. They can't say it's wrong. Examine it. I'd just be real reverent. Now let's pray. Each one now that's got sickness, pray. Now you're the one who has to touch him. I just hear, I can no more, knowing you not, I can no more know anything about you than this thing can speak without something behind it to speak. It's a mute. Just pray. I have no idea. But you promised you'd believe it. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll grant it for your glory. Just in the spirit of worship, say, Lord God, I, I'm so needy. Let me touch you. Don't get nervous. That's where you get hysterical and you get away from him. He's right with you. 
Now, now you may raise your head just a moment. The light of the Holy Spirit that in this, to you scientists, dimension, to you Christians, this atmosphere of the Holy Spirit which now takes me, you couldn't hide your life if you had to. I can't hear you. God's already did that. But it's hanging over a colored woman sitting right here with a little ball in her hand. You're praying for something, aren't you, Auntie? The colored woman? Yes, uh huh. You're afflicted or something's wrong with you. You don't you have a prayer card? You don't have a prayer card? You don't, you don't need one. If the Lord God will reveal to me here, Auntie, what your trouble is, will you believe me to be his servant telling you the truth out of the Bible? You will? You believe. The Lord bless you, sister. That's the reason it's hanging over you. Now, just a moment. It's coming down. There it is. All right? The woman is suffering with arthritis. That arthritis is in her spine. And she also has created from that a real extreme nervous condition. That's exactly right. The colored lady is sitting there with a little ball on her hand. If that's right, lady, yes. Raise up your hand if that's right. I'm talking to the colored lady back there, lady. Please. All right. That does it. You don't have that now. It's gone from you. I don't know why the grace of God, all you white people, I've just been talking about colored people and telling how they were saved. God loves them. That poor little woman there may have less education than anybody sitting here, but she knows God. It happens to be that the Lord had blessed her. There's a colored lady sitting right to next to her there. It looks like that there it is farming around her. She shouted just a few moments ago. I don't know you do, I lady. If the Lord God will tell me what your trouble is, what you're suffering with, will you you know whether it's the truth or not, won't you? You're suffering with scientists. That's right. If that's right, raise up your hand. Gone now. God bless you. You with your hand up there, the other colored lady, sitting there waving your hand. Do you believe me to be God's servant? The young woman? Do you believe me? I don't know you do, a sister. I've never seen you in my life. You believe me to be the servant of Christ, and it's not me? This is a case like Jesus talking to the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan. He was a Jew. You are an Ethiopian woman, and I'm an Anglo-Saxon. It's two different. It's the same spirit. Now, Christ, the woman believed him. Now, Jesus didn't know what her trouble was, but when he found her trouble, he told her her trouble. She went to the city and said, that's the Son of God. That's the Messiah. If he'd tell you the same thing working through you and I now, as told two different races of people, first time ever meeting but you're aware that something's going on, aren't you, lady? A real sweet, humble feeling around you. That's right, raise up your hand. A little color lady with a pink shawl. You are suffering with heart trouble and with a tumor. If that's right, raise up your hand. Jesus Christ heals you. If thou canst believe, some of you white people believe, you newcomers in here. Just, or is in, you should be in a real spirit of worship. We're in the presence of Jesus. Please, friends, if ever you believe as your brother, let me with my Bible on my heart, you believe right now. Just lay aside your theology. Just say, Lord Jesus, I realize there's something here. There's got to be. Here, here it is right over a little man standing right here. Right at the end of the road, he's suffering with his skin trouble. Little fellow there. You believe in God? That's right, isn't it, sir? That's right, raise up your hand. I don't know you, do I? All right, you're going to get over it now. Don't worry. The blessings of God was on you. For it was dark, it's turned light. Have faith in God. Do you believe all of you believe? Here's, now you're praying. Get these people, these newcomers, if we can, right in here where they all help their hands. Now, anywhere, I just have to, wherever you call, that's where I have to answer. There's a little lady sitting right here. 
ลดลงมาแบบสักหนึ่งโลก Yes Do you believe the Lord Jesus would heal you? You were suffering, wasn't you? You are suffering, and you were sitting there in your heart praying. God let Him speak to me tonight. I believe you. Now that's true. Raise up your hand. The lady held the door. Yes. Thank you. If the Lord God would tell me what your trouble is, would you believe Him that He wants to make you well? I see you getting up kind of slow out of the bed. o v e r morning, you got rheumatism. Okay. Now I want to ask you something sincerely. You don't, you don't feel it now, do you? The Lord heals you. That's right. The other lady sitting next to you there, she's suffering too. The little lady with her head down praying. You're praying, Lord, let it be me next. That right? You believe me to be a servant? Sitting out next to the little lady there that just called. Would you love to go eat your supper and enjoy a good meal again? You're suffering with stomach trouble, aren't you? That's right. It's a pesky condition caused from a, a deep thinking. You cross bridges before you get to them and things like that. It's a, more like a mental nervousness. You're not shaky nervous, but you're just you just uh, you get the deep thinking. You ought to do that. Be happy. Now your stomach trouble is gone. Then you feel home. Now. What do you think the other little lady sitting next to you, looking out there, praying? The light went out over on you. With a little rose on your coat. Do you believe me to be God's servant? Please, please, don't let go. That's what does it, man. See, you rob the people of their hands. Please, please, be reverent just a moment. See, your soul, and when you move, it moves the spirit. You say, Brother Bam, psychology. What about Jesus? When he put them all out of the house, Jairus is out, and when he raised the daughter, be reverent, have respect at least for the sick, respect for Jesus. I'll be real reverent again. Now let's see. Or was it? Was the vision breaking? But I don't know where it was. Just keep praying. It seemed like I was right down here in front somewhere. God, surely in His mercy, will do it again. Where was it? It was. It sure is bad. It's the lady with the rose on her coat. That's the one it was. She has a hernia. That's right, isn't it, sister? If that's right, raise up your hand. You believe God for your healing? Will you do me a favor? Lay your hand on that lady next to you. She has arthritis. She wants to get well too. Is that my right, lady? All right. Good. Now you heard it. And the lady sitting next to you, see that dark spirit across there coming in? That's that spirit calling for this one over here for help. Lay your hand on the woman next to you. She has arthritis too. And that's lady there. You had arthritis also, didn't you? You're both healed, so you can go home and be well. God has made you well. Have faith. Back in this way, somebody. Have faith, friends. Believe God. Don't doubt Him. Just believe Him. Right here, right where the woman sitting here is. Yeah. You were praying, wasn't you? Sincerely, I do not know you. Is that right? You don't know me. This is our first time meeting. If the Holy Spirit will tell me what you're praying about, you believe me to be His servant, man. You believe you know now that you're in contact with something. You are a Christian, a believer. You got trouble with your back. It's a back trouble, isn't that right? Mm-hmm. That's what you're praying about. Mm-hmm. You're not from this city. Yeah. You're not even from this state. You can go down and try. Mrs. Lathan, now the L E I G H T O N. Mrs. Lathan, is that right? Raise up your hand. How oh, you're going home well? Your back trouble, bless you. Jesus Christ, Jesus. Do you believe? Does the whole audience believe? Let's bow our heads just a minute, then. Father, we're conscious. We're here in your presence. 
Maybe the people here may never be back again. This may be their last night. While you're present, Lord, I pray thee in Christ's name, be merciful. And with your head bowed just a moment, the organ tunes sweetly and lowly. How many in here now, in the presence of Christ, knowing that he's here, how many would like to raise up their hand and say, Brother Branham, pray for me. I want the real experience with God that you've been talking about. I'm tired of living this half life, and I, I'm a, maybe you're a sinner and you want to be saved. Raise your hand. Will you God way up high? That's right. God bless you. Oh, my. 40, 50, 100 hands or more up in the air. God bless you. I'm going to ask you something. If you play it while she's playing on the organ, if you believe God hears my prayer for the sick, of course, he heard me for this altar call. I want you to come here and stand right down here, around here. Let me come down and pray for you, will you? Right, right slowly now, we're going to stand almost persuaded. And I want each one of you that wants God to change your life right now. If he can change your body, he can change your life. And all that place that he made in you thirsting for him, you want to worship him. And him to come in and take all the desire of the world from you. Will you come right down here for prayer? Will you do it while we're staying almost persuaded? All right, sister, on the organ, if you will, give us the card. All right. All right. church and does the same thing, proving that he's here. And your soul in you condemning you, angels of God standing near and saying, you should go. This may be your last opportunity. You may not get home tonight. You may be laying dead in the bed in the morning. In a year from now, you may be molded in the grave. And now you might not. I don't know. But I'm just saying you could. Someday you will be. Why not now? Do you know that old Southern altar call, oh, why not tonight? Does the people know that? Give us a card on it. And I'm going to ask you something. Come on. You lukewarm church members, you know you have done wrong. You women, you men, boys and girls, get yourself around. I feel led to do this, friends. Surely, God, don't you know I'm telling you the truth? God's proved it. And I'm telling you the truth. There's loads that you need to be standing here. Won't you come now? Won't you come? Oh, do not let the world depart And close your eyes against the light This is the time of them be wise Oh, why not tonight All together, oh, 
until you feel that you're needy, if you feel you're sufficient. Okay. the Bible over my heart. The angel of God is with me. The blood not upon me. I've told you the truth. You need a walk with God. You're walking out of the fellowship. Come on now. This is the hour for you. Come on now. While we sing once more, this is the last. Why? Give me the excuse why. Why couldn't you? Say, my job. Quit it. My mother shall drive me away from home. Many have walked alone with Christ. My Father won't appreciate your Heavenly Father will accept you. I'll give you fathers and mothers. And I had to leave my home too because of it. But God gave me tens of thousands of fathers and mothers around the world. Greatest thing that any man ever did when he, a woman when they come from their seats down to an altar of prayer. Right. I'm not asking you to come join a church. I'm asking you to come receive Christ while his presence here. What more could he do? If he healed the sick, still wouldn't be as great as this. He does heal the sick. He couldn't appear in a visible body because when he does, time shall be no more of him. But he's here in his church showing you that he's raised from the dead, trying to get you to come accept him as your risen Lord. Once more now, while we sing, oh, why not tonight? All right. Oh, why not Stand around these people now. Get in your positions around these. These are trained here to do personal work. Make your places. The rest of you that wants to come with them, come at this time now. Those who have you got a, a room in there somewhere? You take them an instruction room. All right. Just one moment, then. They're coming around now. Others are coming to be saved. Let's bow our heads everywhere while I want to pray as I offered to pray. Dear God, be merciful to these people. This may be our last meeting time, dear God, until we see you standing yonder. Oh, if you're going to come for your church before destruction, before one drop of rain could fall, Noah and his group was in the ark, and the angel of the Lord who went out into Sodom, his message was haste, it was deliverance and mercy. The same angel who had his back turned to the tent and said, Why did Sarah laugh? Oh, God, may the people realize that same angel's here tonight that knows the secret of the heart the same as he knows Sarah laughed back in the tent. She said, I didn't. But he said, oh, yes, you did. What was that angel's message just before the fire fell? Here you are again, Lord. I pray now there's nothing more I can do. They are the fruits of the message. 
your message. They are yours. They've come. No man can come to me, you said, and set my father draws him. Then, God, you had to be here to draw him. Here, many, many people, all this pack floated up and down the aisle. And I pray thee, God, that you have brought them up here, that you'll give them to your dear son as love gift. And then we know that no one can pluck them from his hand. You said, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall never come into the judgment but pass from death unto life. God made this group of hungry people walk into this little room here now and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Or when hands is applied to them and there according to apostolic rule, may they be filled with the Holy Ghost and that fountain of their heart has been touched tonight and all the old tin cans and rubbish of the world has been cleaned out, making a new heart for God to worship. Grant it, Lord, that thirst now is coming for you. Sanctify them at the altar that when they walk in there they may be filled with the goodness of God and His Spirit take them in. Grant it, Lord, I present them to you in Jesus Christ's name. Now while you're here, workers are here, places are for you go right in here so we can go in and pray with you to be filled with God's Spirit. Follow right in now as you're coming. While we keep continue saying, Oh, why not tonight? Again, the audience, Oh, why?